Blanche, and I have the privilege of moderating this panel with one of the one of my favorite authors, who has his books have changed my life. Um, I'm just going to get right to it and bring up Brian K. Vaughn. Thank you for coming out, guys. Happy Friday. Oh, it is Friday. Right on. I was like, no, it's like, oh, it is Friday. <laughs> Seems like Sunday. So, how are you? I'm awesome. And Julian, this is an awesome show, isn't it? Yes. It's like an actual comic book show, not like Hollywood con. I love it. And that's, that's kind of apropos to you, because you're kind of like the comic book guy that does some movies and TV. I do think of myself as comic guy first who dabbles in Hollywood stuff. Yeah, yeah. for sure. So, um, I don't know if any of you have read some of his books. Um, they're, they're just little ones, you know, it's, it's this, this Why the Last Man, you know. I know, right? Which actually got me using comics in the classroom. I snuck it in. You know, I didn't tell anybody, and so it changed my life. Um, uh, Fred of Baghdad. Don't read in an airplane, because people look at you weird when you're bawling. Um, uh, what's that other one? It just keeps still coming out. What's it called? S S Sega? S Sega? Saga? Saga? <laughs> How many people love Saga? <laughs> Every time I read an issue, I'm like, oh, I hate him so much. <laughs> because it's so good and I'm so jealous. Um, and that last, I still love you, even though you wrote that last issue. Um, so no spoilers. Right. People aren't there I, yet. Yeah. I didn't say anything. I'm just saying. Mm. So, so of all the things that you have done with your with writing comics and TV with Lost and Under the Dome mm -hmm. and um, hopefully the upcoming Why the Last Man series coming um, to FX allegedly in 2020, everyone. So hang on, yeah, long we're holding on. Yeah, um, and Runaways and everything that you've done and you've had so many different positions. What's what's your your favorite? My favorite TV? No, your thing? favorite. My favorite. Your favorite thing to do. To oh, create. I like comics so much more than <laughs> film and TV. Film and television is kind of a drag. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> comics I love because comics you can really plan ahead, and then, you know the actors never refuse to come out of their trailer, or you know, <laughs> like a tsunami blows the set away. You really can have complete control over your universe. In film and television. It's sort of more like uh, riding a wild bronco. You just sort of have to hang on, and you can steer it sometimes, but mostly you have to be willing to go with a lot of changes on comics. Yeah, like I say, complete freedom, complete control. So it's way better than film and TV. And if you kill somebody, you don't have to make that call. That you know? awkward <laughs> call, yes. Yeah. Hey, sorry. Exactly. Um, so let's talk about Saga. OK. Um, it's on hiatus. Mm -hmm. when, when, when can we expect it back? I'm, I'm so sorry to disappoint everyone. <laughs> All I can say is that we're working super hard on it, and Fiona and I want to sort of bank a couple of issues. So if you haven't heard, we announced that uh, issue 54 is the halfway point of Saga, so it's going to be 108 issues. And we just want when we come back to do what we did the first time, just put them all out on time and never miss shipping on it. So we're banking issues as we speak. So we're not ready to announce when it's coming back, but I can promise we're working on it. And uh, I think it's going to be even better when we come back. It just It's such a rarity in comics to get to sort of take a break from that treadmill. And so like to have a little downtime from it and come back with fresh eyes has been a, a real honor. So. Thank you for your patience. I'm sorry, but uh, we're working. Well, you can take your time because it's it's the quality. It's it's amazing. Thanks. Um, although some of my cus, I own a comic shop. Um, I have comics in Muncie, um, and my customers aren't aren't happy with that because they're like, we need it now. And I'm like, <laughs> He's kind of busy. Um, so when you wrote Saga, you said you wanted it to just be a comic. Mm -hmm and everybody's speculating other things. And I was like, did you see some of the things in here? So are you still planning on it just to be a comic? Yeah, I really am. I don't have anything against adaptations. The Paper Girls is coming to Amazon, which is really exciting. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, you know, so adaptations are great. And that said, though, I think there are some things that comics can do that film and television can't. And I just, for me, people are always like, who would you like to see playing Marco or Alana? And I, I just want to see Fiona Staples draw them. I just like that. That is important to me. And yeah, I think we sort of got to the point that a lot of people see comics as uh, a sort of blueprint in order to get to the hallowed ground of film and TV, but I don't think that's true. I think sometimes just a comic can be a comic. So um, I want to, uh, you know, and who knows, my kids need braces someday, <laughs> maybe they'll finally decide to sell out or whatever, but for right now, I'm very happy with Saga just being a comic. You've got other things banked you can, you can put out there. Sure, so yeah. It's all good. Um, so when you were writing Why the Last Man, you, I read that you arbitrarily just picked 60 as the number of issues. Yeah. What, why? I mean, I didn't think I would ever get there, but I was <laughs> like, if I could have five years of uh, job security, this would be incredible. So I told Karen Berger, yeah, it's gonna be 60 issues, and she was like, sure, sure, it's gonna get canceled, you know, in the first year. Uh, but yeah, I think as Pete and I started working on it, we felt like this was a good amount of time, that we'd watch Yorick, age more or less in real time. And we realize this is sort of a story about the last boy on earth becoming the last man on earth and that sort of five year journey watching that happen. So it felt right. And so what what was your inspiration for Why the Last Man? It's it's I consider it a, a gender textbook. I think it's it's amazing. Um, I, I just I, I gush over the book all the time. I can't Thanks. Oh, that's very um, nice of you. I feel like I've like paid for part of your house. <laughs> so many copies, um, and I sell it constantly. Um, if somebody, I don't know what to read here. Just you'll thank me, and then they come back in the next day and get the rest of them. Um, so, what was your inspiration for for writing that? I guess I, I just I love uh, talking about gender, and it felt like that sort of when we started talking about the book in the late '90s, early 2000s. That like the extent of talking about gender in comics was like, should she be called the invisible girl or the invisible woman? And I was like, I think we can probably press things a, a little bit further on it. And I guess I've just always been interested in gender. I went to an all boys Catholic high school and sort of the experience of sometimes when we would do theater, like we would have an exchange program, like the girls would come over to our school or the boys would go to their school walking through the hallways uh, of an all-female high school and just seeing the sort of stares of like, what is this creepy <laughs> outsider doing here? I'm sure part of why I was, uh, was born there. And it's also, I guess I have to say, working in comics at the time, I sort of felt like that because it was my friend Devin Grayson who had recommended me for Swamp Thing to editor Joan Hilty, and uh, it was later Heidi McDonald, who was the Y editor, who recommended me to Karen Berger. So I always saw comics as this sort of benevolent matriarchy that I was like this weird outsider working in it. So uh, it's sad that a comics hasn't always been that way. But for me, it was always just being the dopey guy surrounded by powerful, brilliant women. Why just kind of wrote itself. I love that. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, and Saga was inspired by Children. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I uh, co-created babies with my wife. And, uh, uh, yeah, it was very terrifying and uh, strange. And I, I got your parents out here in the crowd. Oh, oh yeah, see, look at this. And you know what it's like. It is terrifying and exciting. But if you try and tell your friends who don't have babies, like they just start nodding off the second you mention like diaper bags or whatever. So. I wanted to write about being uh, a dad, but in the least boring way possible. So I thought I could smuggle it into this sort of weird fantasy sci-fi universe I've been thinking about since I was a kid. And I could uh, you know, show you how it feels to create something, whether that's a baby or uh, a comic book or a movie or whatever it is, just how hard it is sometimes to make new things in a world that doesn't always seem to want new things. Mm -hmm. I always, I describe Saga to people who don't know. I said, well, it's kind of like Star Wars meets Romeo and Juliet if they lived <laughs> and had a baby and they don't know what to do with it. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's pretty fair. I think it was Fiona Staples said, no, it's actually, uh, Starship Troopers meets the old comic strip for better or for worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, you're better. right. That is kind of. And I'm like, I didn't realize. I was like, I love we both. When we first, uh, Fiona and I met, I was asking her, you know, what's your favorite movie? And she said 2001. And I was like, oh, that's my favorite movie too. But it was years later. She told me, she's like, I lied just to sound smart. I, know, I love Starship Troopers. I said, me too. <laughs> But just that movie is like uh, so smart and naughty and subversive and has something sort of angry to say about war. And then for better or for worse was this comic strip that I truly loved growing up and there was nothing else like it. Like if you read Peanuts, just Charlie Brown is always Charlie Brown. But for better or for worse, you'd watch this family sort of slowly grow up over time. And I, was, I, I didn't realize how inspirational that was until Fiona pointed out correctly. That's what I was stealing from. Yeah, it's true, because they aged in like Family Circus, they didn't exactly. age at all. They're always the same. Uh -huh. Yeah. What? Spoiler alert. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Okay. Some, yeah. some of us aren't caught up. <laughs> but, yes, uh, dead animals, though. So that, that's uh, another uh, it's a real uh, thing I love in my book. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry in advance, everyone. We've noticed. Yeah. Um, many tears. Um, so you did i'm going to kind of switch gears we are going to take questions there's a microphone it's live not alive but it works <laughs> um, um well you did a walking dead comic yeah that um they're releasing on local comic shop day that's november 29th i think so yeah please go it's to your local the saturday at the saturday after um Thanksgiving. Yeah. It's like the one with the turkey. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's been a long day. Um, so, but make sure you pick this up because if you haven't read it, it's phenomenal. And I am, I was so angry that I couldn't sell it in the shop. Oh, and now good. I can. Yeah. And I have already have people going, uh, I need this. Nice. Everybody's so excited for that. So, um, you guys can start lining up if you want. I don't want to take this away from you. So, uh, I want to talk a little bit about Paper Girls uh -huh. because this was, this is, it's amazing and it came out at a really great time. You had, you know, you have like Super 8, you have like Stranger Things, you have all of these things and, and so this is a thing. What, what was your inspiration for that? I guess uh, just being like an old man now and uh, <laughs> thinking about uh, how far away it felt to be 12 and to try and remember what it was like to be 12 and uh, thinking about would my 12 year old self like me, like who I've become, or just be sad about being bald and uh, <laughs> what is that like? But I, I do, I mean, I remember uh, some of my families here in the front row. We had uh, delivery kids who would come and there was one year where it seemed like all of the newspaper boys were suddenly replaced by paper girls. And it was sort of, sort of so cool but melancholy because they were like the first of their kind as pioneers, but they were also the last of a dying breed because, you know, the sort of late 80s, early 90s is when everyone realized that the whole concept of sending out children at 4 a.m. To, <laughs> to deliver bad news to adults on bicycles was insane. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, they, they sort of went away, but I, I thought they would be a really good vehicle to sort of discuss uh, nostalgia, and it seems like my generation in particular is really obsessed with the past. And I just wanted to talk about the many ways that the 80s were not, you know, this sort of golden era to remember, but they were actually kind of a terrible place in a lot of ways, too. So, yeah, good old days. We used outhouses. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one more thing, and then we'll get to audience. Um, Private Eye. Oh, yeah. With Marcos Martin, mm -hmm. who is also, you, you also have worked with incredible artists. Very Fiona, lucky. I mean, just, she's amazing. Um, so, but you put that out online for free. Mm -hmm. So, just tell, tell me the process, why you, why you thought about doing that. Yeah, well, that's all entirely my uh, artistic uh, partner, Marcos Martin. Uh, so, uh, we did uh, Doctor Strange together, as I'm mm -hmm. here in the audience, but we did a Doctor Strange uh, book together, and we just, uh, sort of uh, fell in love and like let's work together forever but uh, <laughs> Marcos is uh, lives in Barcelona and uh, he's this weird socialist who hates money and uh, <laughs> he's like I love comic books Marcos said because comics used to be a really inexpensive medium for everyone and like over the years it's become this very expensive hobby for just a few people and he's like, we could use the internet to flip that on its head and take it back to what it used to be, that we could just put out comics and the second we finish it, we could deliver it to people. And he's like, we could do, remember like Radiohead did this thing with an album where they put it out online 
and they charged whatever you wanted to pay. If you didn't have any money, you could have it for free. If you had a buck or two, you could do that. And I was like, Marcos, uh, uh, there's a reason Radiohead never did that again. They just didn't have it once. Like, if it didn't work for them, why would we possibly do that? But uh, he was really passionate about it, and uh, it worked out amazingly well. You people are so kind that it turned out that there were sort of enough people uh, to support it if there were people who couldn't afford to buy it, that it just uh, it worked out. And still to this day, there's never been a day that someone hasn't at least thrown a nickel our way. And so it's still up here right now, panelsyndicate.com. If you want to go read that Walking Dead story before you support your comic book story, you can read it there. And we've opened it up to now, and some of our favorite creators are putting their books on there, so it's not just the two of us. Uh, so yeah, Panel Syndicate's one of the things I'm most proud of, and I can take no credit for it. It's entirely Marcos's idea. It's, there's some incredible things up there, and that's coming from me who likes like comic shops. Yeah. <laughs> I think that the, the thing is that we found is that the, the two are not, uh, the two feed mm -hmm. each they other. Feed and we each found other. so many people who discover the book online, and they're like, I really want the private eye in print, or I want barrier in print, or people who you know come into your store and then want to see more and come mm -hmm. to you. So I, I don't think, People are always afraid that digital is going to kill off comic stores the way that, you know, kill off music stores. But I don't think it will. I think people can have both, I hope. Oh, I love digital. And the barrier was really, did in read barrier? It was amazing. Oh, nice. It nice. was so smart. You, they put the books out and they made a slip case. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. We it's really, amazing. We series. wanted to do something uh, that you couldn't get on Amazon. No offense to my paymasters at Amazon <laughs> for making the Paper Girl show, but we wanted to do something that was purely a comic. So when we did Barrier in print, we're like, we're not going to do a collected edition that you'll be able to buy online. We're just going to do five print issues that you have to go into wonderful stores like yours to pick up. So that was really fun. I, I also, I would like to give a round of applause to him because when he announced the Paper Girls on Amazon, he said, go to your local comic shop and buy it. <laughs> and all of the comic shop retailers rejoice like Monty Python. So oh, thank nice. you. Do that, so thank you. I'm sure thing? Jeff Bezos talked to his assassin. So <laughs> <we're gonna take laughs> it you guys watch him. Yeah. Yeah. Bodyguards. Okay. One more thing. I read that you turned down um, Marvel to make like a Brian K. Vaughn universe. <laughs> <laughs> how, would, how do you think if you accepted that, it would have changed everything? I mean, it was really nice. Yeah, it was like Joe Casada years ago. It's like, we'll just put out a book. It's called Brian Givon Presents, and whatever you want to do that month, you can pour it in, and it was a tremendous honor. But um, yeah, just I feel like Marvel and DC Comics are my divorced parents who raised me. <laughs> like I, I worked for both of them for over a decade, and I learned so much, and I'm so grateful. Uh, but it also felt like I've been living with mom and dad for a very long time, and it's kind of time to go to college, yeah. which is Image Comics, and <laughs> Image is like uh, college, where you have so much more freedom, but more responsibility, like, oh, I have to do my own laundry here, or like my own balloon placements, there's no editor to do this, and, uh, but it's been a, a joy, so, I, you know, I don't think about it too much, because it's also, it's no false humility, I, I think there's a reason that people are always nice and bring up Saga, for this, and there's not like big stacks of Ultimate X-Men uh, that people bring up. Uh, that I think I've always been better working on characters that I helped create. And there's some people, uh, you know, Jeff Johns, uh, Mark Wade, incredible creators who are so good at pouring themselves and other people's characters. And I've never been as good, so I'd rather let those guys write, you know, Marvel and DC books, and I'm to do my weird. Spanish uh, alien abduction comics. <laughs> I would disagree that you're, because I think you're awesome and whatever, <laughs> right? But I'm really glad you did turn that down because Saga, Thanks. Why the Last Man, everything. All right, sir, tell us your name and. I uh, interjected my questions about panel seven okay. again last second. Uh, but I, Sorry. <laughs> Just, yeah, love all the stuff. Um, are there more upcoming Panel Syndicate stuff that you're excited about or want to discuss then? I For sure. I can say that there's uh, something that Marcus Martin is up to uh, without me, a separate writer, and I am so jealous. <laughs> it is like I'd seen your ex with another guy, I guess, is what it is, but it's, uh, he's not ready to announce uh, what it is just yet, but I think it's, it's gonna be one of the best books of his career. So that is coming. I also have a bunch of brand new creators who are coming to Panel Syndicate, so 
Um, I sort of want to get ahead on Saga first before I move on to any other new books, but I'll definitely be back. Panel Syndicate, I hope I'll be making books for the rest of my life. Another note on that. Thank you for putting it in open formats. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's something where I don't know if people know that a lot of these, like if you're on Comixology or stuff, they have this DRM, it's called Digital Rights Management. And so it feels like you don't really own your book when you do that, that it can sort of disappear or go away at any time. And especially when we were doing a book like uh, Private Eye, which is all about a, a future where the internet is going to evaporate and disappear. <laughs> we wanted everyone to know that if you buy a comic, uh, or even if you don't buy you just uh, uh, download it, that it's yours to keep forever. So thank you for noticing that. Hi, my name is Gabriel. Hi. Uh, my question is on um, what kind of process or, process or method you use for choosing artists to work with? Because uh, a few years ago, back in 2015 in New York Comic Con, I saw you at a panel and you mentioned you want to do paper girls again because you wanted to work with Click because you worked previously. So I'm just curious, like, again, how do you kind of go to an artist like if you have staples? Is it um, by refer refer uh, reference or you go yeah. out and just find you know, catches your eye? It's a, every book is different. Yeah, like you mentioned, paper girls was something Cliff and I had first worked together on a Swamp Thing story a million years ago, and I'd written a, a short Swamp Thing story at Vertigo and uh, no artist wanted to draw it because I was a nobody and I'm sure the script was terrible and they're like, well, all we had is one of our assistant editors said he would draw it. I was like, this is gonna be terrible. But uh, it was Cliff Chang and it was the first printed work that he ever did and it was some of the best art that I'd ever seen in my life and I just so lucked out and uh, we were like, we have to work together again and I think that was 1999 when we worked together so it took us years and years to do that, but we finally circled back around. So sometimes it's lucky that I was partnered with someone like Marcos by a Marvel editor, you know, and then we chose to work together. But Fiona, I think that was me. The idea came first, and then it was just seeking out artists, and it's so hard to find. Artists are like, this is a non-superhero book, and uh, it's got a bunch of swearing and boobs in it. It's, you know, like, I don't want to draw this. and. Uh, I talked with a writer named Steve Niles, who's incredible, and Steve is like, there's an artist named Fiona Staples who not only can draw anything, she will draw anything. <laughs> and yeah, so I reached out to her and uh, sort of pitched her the idea, and she's like, this sounds incredibly weird. I'll dedicate decades of my life to this. So I'm just, I'm so lucky. All right, thank you. Thank you. Aquaman, looking good. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brandon. Hi, Brandon. Um, so, one of my friends told me to read Saga, and I'm only been reading about two years, and I finally listened to him like last month, so I'm still reading it. But uh, one of the first, the first book I did read of yours was Doctor Strange, nice. and can you just like walk us through the story, like how you came up with that, and yeah. your reaction when Benedict Cumberbatch took a picture of Cronus and Serena? That was crazy, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, Doctor Strange uh, was a character that I always hated, and uh, I just like, you know, he would always sort of show up in a comics that I was reading, and he'd be the sort of deus ex machina, that he would just show up, and I'm like, oh, we need somebody to like clean up here, and he'd show up and, and say a bunch of spells, and uh, I was like, this is a terrible character, but uh, so when they said, you know, do you want to do something? And Marcos Martin, the artist, was really like, you're stupid, go back and read the original Lee Ditko stuff. And reading that, like you saw, like everything Lee and Ditko did, it was so smart and so elegant. And their idea that, oh, he was a, a man of science forced to do magic, and that uh, he was really kind of like an arrogant dick, I liked, <laughs> and that he was a guy who needed to use his hands, he was a great surgeon, and then that he lost that, and like the sort of tragedy of it all, and you're like, oh, you don't have to pour anything new into these characters, you just sort of have to go back and see like what uh, you know, Lee and Ditko were trying to do in the first place, so I, I hope we just sort of honored them. And uh, yeah, it was uh, just really fun to tell something that was sort of based and uh, sort of our world, and a little more grounded, and uh, just always trying to give magic rules, I think, is a way, and limitations uh, to what was really fun. So, yeah, it was an honor. And then to hear the director of the Doctor Strange movie say that the comic book was an inspiration and that they took scenes from it to use was incredible, and my son didn't believe it, so we had to go see the movie and sit through the credits, and it's like, wait for it, my name is, wait for it. Yeah, right there, around the corner. So, yeah, tremendous honor.
It's Mark Bagley watching Spider-Man 2. So. Exactly. Yeah, it's incredible. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, but do you like Doctor Strange more now? Now I do. Okay. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I, I, I came to appreciate it. I've got the tattoo, so, so I'm glad you said He's that. an incredible <laughs> character, but yes. It was my ignorance. I know. Isn't this amazing? This is Put this amazing. Line down, everyone. This is amazing. Yeah, amazing. Oh, yeah, the wheel is back there. They're a pair. Um, hey, I forgot my question there. <laughs> oh, okay, so I, I love Saga. The first time I read it was on a plane to Germany, and then I had to download, like, volumes onto my iPad. It was like, I just need to know what's happening. Again. Thank you. Um, and one of the things that I really loved about Saga, and most of your work, is that it's a story, and it's creative, and it's still touches on like very serious political issues and I was really impressed with the sex trafficking that um yeah the, Sophie the, yeah so the was theory mm -hmm. will and I was I think that's really cool and I really like the way you tie it into the story but do you I mean do you do it on purpose or are you really passionate about these kinds of topics? For sure. I think uh you know Star Wars is obviously a, a huge influence and I revere George Lucas and I think particularly the first Star Wars movie just like knowing how hard it is to get a movie made, that he was able to sort of go in and pitch, like, there's a guy called Chewbacca. And he sometimes <laughs> like, it's impossible to think how that movie got made and so much imagination. And so I revere him. I think at the same time, it's strange that I knew, like, when I had kids, that, like, this is also a kid's introduction to things like war. And Star Wars is an amazing escapist fantasy that has important things to say, but it's not really an accurate reflection of war, obviously. It's a story of good versus evil, and war has almost nothing to do with good versus evil. And similarly, it always kind of creeped me out that, like, uh, Princess Leia, who's just so badass in the first Star Wars movie, it was sort of at a time in the late 90s that any time you showed up to a convention, it was just slave girl Leia everywhere. And it's sort of thinking about like, oh, like the whole concept of slave girl is uh, terrifying, especially in a world where like sex trafficking is real. And so I think that was something that Fiona and I wanted to do, that if we're gonna write something in this fantasy sci-fi universe, we'll do it as a way to talk about our own world. So yeah, no, I think it's something that's really important to us and uh, to do a book that sort of, uh, even though it seems like it's a galaxy far, far away, is really about us. So. Yeah, I really liked it, and the fact that now you mentioned war is that I think Saga it explains war like perfectly, and there's never like one good side and one bad side. Um, so I just really like, thank you. Thank you so question. much. Thank you. I like your Isabel shirt too. It's awesome. <laughs> right on. <laughs> I love Saga. Um, so I just wanted to say the um, Why the Last Man Gave Hope to a lonely senior, a lonely English major in college. Oh, that's so, so cool. I wanted to say thank you for Why the Last Man. And um, my question really piggybacks off hers. Um, a lot of your books have a lot of social commentary, so whether it be the endless war in something like Saga or um, uh, in uh, Private Eye, when you're talking about the cloud and the, what happens when the information on the cloud breaks down yeah. and everyone's worst secrets are public knowledge. Um, so I just, wanted to, I just wanted to ask, how do you come about um, with your stories, the, sort of the social commentary first, the narrative with the characters, what is really the driving factor behind that, and how do you decide what story is going to uh, tackle what subject? Yeah, I guess I just I always think of writing as a cheap therapy, so I guess it's always uh, I write about whatever frightens and confuses me. So. Um, it's never, uh, I, you know, I hope it's not a preachy like, oh, I have the answers to everything, so now I will yell at people about it through the form of comics. It's always like, I, I don't know what the answer is, so I think I will, you know, write about it and throw these characters in the situation and, and sort of see what comes out of it. But, yeah, I think it always starts with, yeah, sort of why I came, you know, post being dumped or uh, Ex Machina came after, uh, you know, 9-11, and it's always like whatever, kind of trauma of varying degree, I have survived and then need to process it. Writing makes me feel better. So yeah, it's always um, start with the, what a broken person I am first and then try and squeeze some characters into it next. Thank you. Thank you. What are you up to now, by the way, as a former English major? I, I work in uh, 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 talent acquisition. Oh, sweet. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I know. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Sam. Um, I'm new to comics, so I actually 
didn't realize that you wrote the Alien from her comic shop, so I'm really excited about that. Yeah, cool. Um, so I was wondering what, like, how that happened, because didn't Kirkman wrote Right, yeah, he has written, uh, yeah, uh, I am the only writer other than Robert Kirkman to be lucky enough to write something <laughs> canonical in this uh, universe. But yeah, it happened because um, we did the, uh, the Private Eye online, and uh, Robert Kirkman was like, uh, I love this, this is uh, great, but you dummies should uh, do it in print through uh, image. And uh, yeah, <laughs> and we were like, no, we don't want to. And uh, we jokingly said, uh, if uh, we'll give you the private eye if you give us Walking Dead. And he's like, done, sold. <laughs> uh, and he, he called our bluff. And uh, we're like, oh man, that's uh, that's very cool of him. But yeah, so we uh, we pitched him uh, this idea for a standalone story. And it was, you know, uh, if you're a fan of the Walking Dead comic, it's set entirely in the United States. But we wanted to do something set in Barcelona, which is where Marcos lives. But we wanted to show, you know, how the this sort of zombie plague was affecting the rest of the world. But we also wanted to do sort of a big twist to address something. And uh, yeah, so we, we called it the alien, since Robert always joked that he was going to explain at the end of the book that aliens cause the zombie plague. But I think if you read the issue, you'll find out who the alien is in this world. But it was so fun, and Robert was so grateful to do it. And yeah, he said, okay, you guys can do it and keep it online forever, and you can keep every penny that people donate to you online if just someday, far, far in the future, you'll finally let me do a print version. And so he was true to his word, and he waited until after Walking Dead was over. So that's yeah, so cool was that. that? Uh, I don't remember how many years ago it was, but several. It's been a while now. So. Are you going to print it again, or is this going to be like... I think, I mean, knowing Robert, if he can bring another nickel out of you guys, <laughs> every possible version of it. But. I have to say, it's, uh, well, uh, I'll have a big stack of them, I'll say, because I, I think he's just planning on, on keeping it like this for a while. But it will say it's cool, if you've read the digital version, he did when we did it in print, it's uh, expanded, so instead of uh, uh, the sort of digital version was shaped, Marcus did, to re be read in a screen, so it's a sort of widescreen version. And so uh, Robert did it, so it's like a big double page spread every page. And Marcus's art is big and beautiful. And then uh, he got the artist who did the gray tone colors for Walking Dead to do that. And he got his letterer to re-letter it in this. Uh, if you've read the digital version, the print version will be uh, different and sort of closer to his style. I like them both, so um, please give both of us money. <laughs> I think we would have ordered way more than we could because you know it's a local comic shop big thing. But well, maybe if you make more, we'll get more. Okay, all right. <laughs> That's very kind of you. What's your story? Um, born again in Do uh, Delaware. Sweet. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, we're excited. Right on. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric. Hey, Eric. Um, I want to say uh, Saga came out right when I first became a parent, oh, uh, and so it was really special to me, especially just how it opens up. Um, with the birth right there, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, true, true to life, right? And I, and I also um, always think about uh, uh, the opposite of war, which I'm not going to finish that since there's literally a baby here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but my my question to you, and, and I don't know if you think about this because you you know you're working on Saga and you have other things, but um, Private Eye meant a lot to me, you know, with the essentially the grandpa character is is me, you know, basically, like, right? And and like. What do you think, as things have gone on, like, there's more stuff in the cloud and, and the stuff that happened, you know, in 2016 and might happen in 2020, yeah. like, how, does, how do you think about, if you do, if you have time to, how the internet keeps working? It seems like we're getting more towards the private eye, in a way. Was, yeah, I have to say, when the private eye first came out, we would pitch the idea to people, and they were like, this sounds insane. And like, we're like, well, it's kind of like it's a fairy tale parable. But now we just saw a couple of weeks ago, there was a fashion show and it was all fashion based on beating facial recognition technology. So it was people wearing masks and costumes and now like what's what's going on in Hong Kong where they've outlawed wearing masks in public and it, uh, yeah, and it's definitely like, uh, yeah, every day it feels like there's another sort of major hack and that our the information is being released. So. Yeah, uh, I don't like being prescient, and uh, <laughs> my wife is like, can you write something nice that will come through in the future? But it does seem like, yeah, we are headed more and more towards that uh, scary dystopia. 
Well, thanks for everything you give us. That's very nice of you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lydia from Baltimore. <laughs> kind of, by the way, Anyway, um, so I'm a little, maybe a little different from a lot of people in here in that I'm 43 and working I'm 43. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so. um, but no, uh, your comic books were actually my introduction to comic books. Oh, um, I'm, you know, I, I've watched all of the Marvel and DC and, and everything and, and Love all of them, but have never actually felt the interest to pick up one. My husband has read everything. And he said, here. And I said, okay. And then, at, you know, working, mom, being in school, I was like, I need more. And on, on top of Harry Potter. Um, so my, my question to you, or, or my, my thanks to you, um, as a humanities major and just writing a paper about um, identity, um, I have a biracial child, and um, reading Saga hit me. I had my only child, and it, it just hit me at all kinds of levels. And, um, you know, figuring out how, how my son sees himself, uh, especially as a teenager now. Um, so, thank you. But also, how did you consciously come to the decision to have not just biracial, but by planetary. I have to say, this is where it's uh, all credit to Fiona Staples. Uh, when I was working with her early on, you know, I said, you know, and she's responsible for the design, every bit of these characters, because I said, you know, just Marco's a dude with horns, and Alana's a lady with wings, and so, you know, make them look cool. And I was like, Alana, you know, maybe don't make her a redhead, because there's kind of a glut of redhead in comics. and. You know, very patiently with me was like, um, do they have to be white? And I was like, oh, it's such a blind spot as a the white guy, and especially writing fantasy science fiction, where it feels like white is the default for, you know, characters. If it's Bilbo Baggins, or, you know, Harry Potter, or Luke Skywalker, and then we start with white, and then we give them things. And it was really, uh, uh, Fiona was like, uh, let's do something uh, different. and. Uh, uh, Fiona has an Asian background. She's like, I want Marco to be Asian, but not sort of comic book Asian. And, uh, you know, let's uh, work hard. Because as she pointed out, yes, you were telling a story about a multiracial child and these worlds colliding, and they should look different than their traditional characters. So it's just such a benefit uh, of working with uh, people who are different from you. And uh, so, yeah, I have to give all credit to Fiona for that, for expanding my horizons. Well, thank you for being open to having oh, you. Thank you so much, it means a lot. Hi, uh, my question was, uh, I'm sure after writing so much stuff, you now have like a process maybe you go through, um, but I was curious as somebody who's trying to start writing a comic, who's never written a comic before, how did you find your process of how to start writing a comic? Because it seems so like daunting and there's so many things to juggle. Yeah, uh, my wife calls it the roller coaster. Now where it's like every issue is the same, where like my mental health at the beginning is pretty good. Like, okay, I got a new thing to write and this is gonna work out. Like I got exciting things to say. And then like it starts to go down. And then like the middle of the process, and it takes me like about two weeks to write a comic. So at the end of the first week is I'm just suicidal. And it's like, none of this works and I don't know how to write and uh, this is so hard, and why is my dialogue so bad, and I quit, I'm gonna give up. And then like the rumors you like start to go up, because then like Fiona will start sending me art, and I'll be like, oh, at least the art is beautiful. <laughs> and then you just go like power through, and it's like, they say art is never finished, it's just abandoned by the end, you're like, oh, it just feels good to be done. And it has been this way for, I've been now writing comics 22 years, and it's the same every time. It's, it's like it hasn't gotten any easier. It's just, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a slog, but I've just found you just have to sort of stay at the keyboard, that that is the hardest thing. That whenever I hear people are like, you know, I have writer's block, I'm like, oh, of course, like writing is not fun. It's like, it's not a real job. It's not like any of you have real jobs. You know, like, this is a joy compared to that. But it's never, I've never been one of those writers who are like, oh, it's another great day of writing. I don't look forward to it. I find it mentally taxing and uh, it's a drag. But I, I just, I sort of force myself 
to uh, write seven days a week, and even if it's just a little bit, even if it's just getting one page of garbage out, that if you just force yourself to do it, it starts to feel strange on the day that you don't write. But I am not a, a natural writer, and I, it felt like it just takes a lot of practice and less slamming my head against the wall. So just, just sticking at it every single day is the only thing I know how to do. Well, that's a relief. You're brilliant, so thank you. <laughs> You're nice. Thank you. That was awesome. That was awesome. You made it. Incredible. You're a genius. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Awesome. So my question has to do with Runaways. Yeah. Um, cool. When I first started reading comics, I was most of the stuff I got was from my school library. Oh, and you can yeah. imagine the selection there isn't exactly more the most mature stuff. And it was like this random young adult book. So I just kind of decided to get it because I knew Marvel. But after reading it, just the way it... It always amazed me how a group about a bunch of people that I cannot identify with in any way whatsoever, like a group of teens who grew up wealthy with famous parents or whatever, like you still managed to make them all so real. And it was like they had the same problems I did and the same kind of stuff. And it was just, how did you do that? How did you make some people that are so hard to relate to so relatable? Thank you. That is really nice. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess I just think like, uh, you know, like I've written Batman before, and no one's ever like, how do you write Batman? Whereas like Batman is, you know, a billionaire with dead parents, and I like when I was writing Batman, it's just an impoverished kid with alive parents, and I never punched anyone, and I'm out of shape, and bald, and like, that seems to me like unimaginable how to write that character. But like the Runaways, I find like if I just write to the height of my intelligence, like I about reach that of a 16 year old, and so it just feels believable, I think. So I just try and, um, yeah, I think I just try to write everyone as I, I don't think we're all that different. And I think just everyone is, uh, you know, has pretty similar hopes and fears, you know, regardless of their socioeconomic. Uh, gender, identity, whatever. I, I think uh, we're all more alike than we are separate. So, you know, I try to write to the best of my abilities, but then, like I mentioned with Fiona, it is, I think, the joy of comics is getting to collaborate with people who are different from you. And working with an artist like Adrian Alfona on Runaways, it's like, I, I love artists who, you can't tell who their inspirations are. Like, he is so unique and so himself. And I think just the way he drew those characters, it was just like, uh, you just fell in love with them right away. And even though they didn't have costumes or uniforms, you knew who they were and you cared about them. So uh, yeah, it's uh, I think just uh, working with great people and just being open to their ideas and what they bring to you is just, you know, it's always hopefully makes it more than the sum of its parts. Thank you. And that book is still, like, I reread it again recently, a couple of years ago, and it's still like, can't get through it without tearing up certain parts. Like, oh, like well, I'm not even a teenager anymore, this still speaks to me. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's really weird to have, uh, yeah, my kids just started uh, reading that book. And uh, yeah, my son uh, uh, picked it up a few years ago. And uh, at one point, Gert in the comic is talking about, like, you can't trust your parents. All they do is lie to you. They lie to you. And they say, this isn't going to hurt, you know? And they lie and they say, everything's going to be OK. Or they lie to you about Santa Claus. And, my son was like, Santa Claus? <laughs> I was like, oh my god, my younger self has sabotaged my future parenthood. Like, ever since then, he's like, I, I know also you murder people in the basement at night. <laughs> and like, my children do not trust me now. So, yeah, it's like, a real mistake to write that book about uh, don't trust your parents. I, I was not planning ahead when I did that as a young person. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi. My name is Sinead. Um, I'm a writer as well, and um, I wanted to ask you, when, what exact moment did you know that you were going to be a writer? And when were you, when did you know you were ready to share your work with the world? And what did you learn about yourself um, by writing? Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, let's see. I think I was uh, 12 years old on a, a family trip with my siblings over here in the front row, and I got a uh, watchman at a comic book store, and instead of paying attention to them, I just sat in the back of the family van and I read Watchmen from start to finish. They're all nodding. Yeah. <laughs> but I, it just uh, blew my brain open. And it was Watchmen was kind of the first time that I realized, like, oh, there are people behind this. 
and uh, I want to be them. And uh, yeah, so all credit to Alan Moore. It just remains like just my shining star. And, uh, and it, it felt like, uh, yeah, like I said, that it wasn't just something uh, that was uh, usually like when I read, you know, Spider-Man or whatever, I dream about, like, I hope they make a not crummy Spider-Man movie someday. That would be amazing. Or A Watchman was really the first book that I read. And I was like, I hope they never make a movie of this. Because, like, it just, this should just, this is everything that's great about comics. So, yeah, that made me want to be a, a writer and a comic book writer in particular. Um, so, yeah, that's... Uh, that's when I wanted to start being a writer, and then, sorry, what were your, was that part two of that? The part two was, uh, when did you start um, identifying yourself as a writer, coming out of Brown and knowing that your ideas were, were safe to show, show to the world, not yeah. just to yourself? Uh, yeah, I was really lucky to, I met Neil Gaiman at a signing when I was in college, and I was like, uh, do you have any advice for a young writer? And he's like, yeah, you should um, get published as soon as possible because <laughs> nothing will make you a better writer faster than knowing that complete strangers are reading your garbage. <laughs> and I'm like, that's true, because at the time, you know, like in school, like we would all sit there and read our short stories to each other, and everyone's so nice to you in school, and like they clap for you, and I'm like, this is nice. And then like I, I started writing Swamp Thing, and I was like, there was this new thing called the internet at the time, and I was like, let's see what these people think about it. <laughs> I was like, uh-oh, I don't like it too much. But it was good, it was like a good hurt to go from so quickly being like, wow, my book is on a shelf, to being like, I gotta get this book off the shelf, people are gonna read this. So I think it is, yeah, I, I think you just have to um, force yourself, like you'll never be ready, and you have to be open to that pain of knowing, you know, that people aren't going to like your stuff, and that's okay, because even now, like, uh, uh, you know, it's 17 years since I read Swamp Thing. Some of you are nice enough to bring up Swamp Thing and say nice things about it. I'm like, where were you online in the 90s? <laughs> and it is like, don't worry, people are always going to hate your stuff. And it'll never be ready to be shared in a way that everyone will love it. But that doesn't matter. Like, as long as you feel good about it and uh, you had something to say, like, you'll find your audience eventually. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Good luck with your writing. Hello. Hello. Awesome. Uh, huge fan. Uh, Nicholas Sire, shame on me, but I have read by the last man. Cool. And so uh, a handful of books that have only, you know, just after they were done, I'm going to have to pick up the trades. Almost Fables, one with by the, by the Last Man. Well, like, so just a couple of questions. One, like, what, what was your, uh, what, what were you thinking about when creating? What, what was the end game? What were you trying to convey? This is such a great story, such great characters. You know, For why? For why the last man. Yeah, I guess, you know, I never, like I say, start off with, here's what I have to say. It's always like, what do I have to ask? And uh, it was, yeah, I think I was just uh, uh, confused and scared about the opposite sex. And like, how are we all going to, uh, oh, my sister's putting it in my hands. Just knowing that I remain uh, t terrified of uh, just everyone. But yeah, I think I just wanted to sort of uh, figure out, uh, yeah, who am I? And... Uh, um, yeah, I don't know, this is an extremely odd, I guess I never know. I don't know, I still don't know where these uh, come from, but it felt good writing it, is all I know. Yeah, there's another, there's another major, I appreciate the, the storytelling, which is great storytelling. One more question, um, there was, was a talk about back to the movie, like, if they were to do that, would you endorse that? The uh, why, uh, it, yeah, it's actually, it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's gonna be a TV show, oh, allegedly. Yeah, okay. yeah, coming to FX, and I, I can't uh, endorse it more, it is. <laughs> They, uh, yeah, they take, it, it's definitely, it's gonna be something new. Don't expect that. I also don't want it to just be an exact translation of the comic. The book is on the shelf, they can't take that away from us. I want them to do new things and have it be hopefully relevant to today, but I think it's great. So I hope you guys like it. Thank you so much. Hello. Oh, hi, my name's Chris. Hey, Chris. Uh, first thing is more of a statement. The, the moment in Saga, and I'll be vague, uh, it's early on, but it's the, the panels that you, you did with Fiona where uh, Sophie and Lion Cat are out in the field. It, that is the most gorgeous thing that I've Thank ever so much. seen and read. And I mean, it's so simple, the, the writing obviously, but you know, that's that moment, like, not that it wasn't hooked, but that was the moment that like completely pulled me in and I just did, you know, it was amazing. Thank you. Um, the, sec the second thing is the question, what do you think it is about your work that pulls in the diverse audience that it does. Because you have 
a lot of people, obviously from around the world, who are fans, and obviously this room is you know, just looking around. The room is incredibly diverse. And you know, what do you think it is about your work that, that draws so many different people from so many different backgrounds in? Thanks. I, I hope um, it's as easy as. I think people want to love comics, and I think a lot of us who grew up reading comics take for granted that there's a barrier of entry, that a lot of times, like if you give, I remember like being in college and falling in love with a comic and giving it to someone, and they're like, I don't even know where to begin. Do you read the words first, or the pictures, or like, how do you go from, I was like, you dummy, it's easy. It's like, it's reading. <laughs> But I was like, it's a complicated language. And I think I've just been fortunate enough to work with artists who are like, we want to make this accessible to anyone. And then you open it, and if the only comics you've ever read are Peanuts, uh, you know, uh, that you would be able to follow this. And so I, I hope it's as easy as that. I, I think that of just doing books that are inviting, and on that first page, it sucks you in. And you're not thinking about, how am I supposed to read this? Just the art is pulling you into the story. And I do think there's a reason that like when we do uh, propaganda in the United States, like we drop pamphlets in other countries, we do it in comic book form, because it is this universal language of words and pictures. So I think it is me just learning after doing comics long enough that the people are coming for the art, stay out of the way of the art, and sort of play to the artist's strength. And uh, it'll, you know, you don't have to work on like, you know, there was always sort of this thinking of like, oh, women only read comics if there's a female protagonist, do you need like 80% romance? And I think that's nonsense. It's like, uh, I remember in college giving Preacher, every you know, person who loved Preacher, and uh, it was just because Steve Dillon and Garth Ennis are incredible storytellers who invited you in. So I just tried to steal from geniuses like that and making it books that are hopefully accessible to anyone. Thank you. Thank you. Last two, so putting the yep. pressure on you guys. Hi, uh, I'm Joe. Hey, Joe. I was just wondering, um, do you ever feel any pressure, either like from society or from like publishers, for self censorship or like censorship of your work in general? I mean, I think, uh, yeah, even like working at Vertigo, uh, you find out that even if a book is creator owned, you're still sort of part of the Warner Brothers behemoth, and there are things that uh, you know you're simply not allowed to do. Uh, and, you know, that's why I'm so happy at Image, because to a fault, uh, there's no oversight uh, there. <laughs> Sometimes, uh, yeah, we would have, you know, self filating dragons, and uh, you know, he's like, I think we're going to go to prison for a couple of minutes. <laughs> like, no, it's, it's fine. Everything is, uh, is going to be okay. Or, like, when we did uh, uh, Paper Girls, I remember, like, that book ends with uh, an Apple logo, and we just do a lot of stuff about Apple. And, Image was like, uh, can you guys do this? Like, aren't they gonna sue us? And I was like, no, I, I check with the lawyer, it's fine. <laughs> I didn't check with anyone, so no. I was like, uh, I'm a big fan of the, you know, ask for uh, forgiveness, not permission, and so I love it. So no, we, we have no censorship whatsoever, and even less at Panel Syndicate, where you know, we truly have no oversight. So yeah, and I, I like being able to say whatever filth is on my mind. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank, you. Your work, Thank you. Yeah, my poor mom. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Janet. I'm Janet. from Canada. Oh, right on. So my question is actually about we stand on guard. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The fear that lingers in all Canadians about the day that happened. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so where did the idea come from? Yeah, uh, that's going to happen, you know, we're coming to the We're well aware that that's yeah. going to happen. Um, yeah, all of my favorite uh, collaborators, uh, you know, are Canadian, Adrian Alfona on Runaways is uh, Canadian, Pia Guerra is uh, Canadian, Fiona Staples, Canadian, my wife is yeah. Canadian. So, it's just my whole life has been enriched by you wonderful Canadians, and I was like, oh, I want to do a book about invading and murdering. <laughs> Uh, would be fun, but yeah, a lot of that came from like meeting my wife and uh, being like, well, you know, I'm from uh, Cleveland, and uh, yeah. Cleveland is where Superman was created, and she was like, no, it wasn't. Superman is a Canadian creation. I was like, what the hell are you talking about? And uh, sort of finding out uh, about our sort of, uh, yeah, you know, both countries actually claim Siegel and Schuster as their own, and uh, it was interesting. I, I just, I like writing about our differences, but 
I think sort of like Pride of Baghdad, I just always like writing about war and the sort of non-combatant victims of war. And you know, I, I guess I'm still sort of traumatized by the Iraq war. And it's hard to write about Iraq in a way that I think we can identify with. And so I thought, oh, if I'm sort of invading our dear neighbors to the north instead of a Middle Eastern country, uh, we would probably have an under easier time, you know, bridging that cultural divide and think about what it means to invade and occupy right. someone. When I think, like, for us in Canada, we never think of ourselves as little as, like, we're so friendly, why are we yeah. <laughs> that? So, yeah. it anyways, is, it's interesting. Thank you so much. I mean, I'm uh, sorry in advance for eventually invading here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for coming out on a Friday night, guys. It's very sweet of you.